and welcome to Cardiovascular Research Online. My name is Tom Guzik and I'm an Editor-in-Chief of Cardiovascular Research. And today I have a huge honor of uh, hosting for our Cardiovascular Research Online, Professor Stefan Ackenbach, the incoming uh, President of the European Society of Cardiology and a Professor and uh, Chief of Cardiology at the University of Erlangen in Germany. Welcome, Stefan. Welcome, Tom. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. So, Stefan, the first uh, question is uh, a question that immediately comes to mind when I speak to somebody who combines so efficiently not only working for global and European cardiology, but also clinical medicine and uh, role in imaging. What is the secret of success? How can young people follow you? Well, first of all, I think it's uh, excitement about what you're doing and, and pleasure in what you're doing and finding your topic really interesting. But then when people ask me what is the success in research or in life in general, I remember Thomas uh, Edison, who said uh, a genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. And there's probably a lot of truth to that. I cannot agree more. So if you look at your life, what was your greatest achievement so far? Well, my um, professional research activities are centered around imaging. And since we're talking about research, I think the achievement that the group around me has been able to, um, to fulfill was that we moved what was our initial idea, coronary CT angiography, using CT to visualize the coronary arteries, to move this all the way to clinical application. People, other people have joined us on the way, and we have been able to contribute it part towards this. And when we all saw that we have a class one recommendation to use coronary CTA in patients with suspected coronary disease. And this was something that about 30 years ago was the first idea that then finally came to clinical um, impact that was very, very rewarding. I agree. Uh, I have been throughout my uh, professional life uh, always uh, uh, with observing with great interest the development of, uh, of CT. But uh, as with every discovery, they usually start with uh, basic technology and basic observations. And as cardiovascular research is a basic and translational uh, science journal, we have to ask, uh, what do you think is the, the route for translation? What is the, the basis uh, for, uh, for, for cardiovascular imaging uh, and using CT from the point of view of, uh, of sort of basic technology? And how difficult was it to bring it to clinical practice? It was super difficult. I mean, first of all, there was simply technology hurdles that had to be overcome with a heart that is moving so rapidly and the structures that are so small to find ways in which we can have optimal image quality in spite of these difficult circumstances. So really, you know, everybody working together to get the technology solved was the first thing. And then the question is, where can you reasonably use it? in the clinical context. And I think that's true for all the research discoveries. Once you have found a new way of doing things, you have to think what is really clinically relevant. And this is where the exploration should go. And that's probably also a secret to success. I suppose also uh, from what, I, what you are saying, it's uh, partially related to huge interaction between physicists, mathematicians, and clinicians in order to develop uh, such technologies. So indeed, uh, this is not easy. And thinking about basic science, and that is, uh, it's hard to find more basic science than mathematics and, uh, and physics, is there a place for societies like ESC to facilitate the translation between basic science and, uh, and, and clinical uh, use? Well, that's why these societies are so important, because in various formats, they bring together those who have the basic knowledge and the basic talents and those who are the clinicians on the receiving end and can explain what is needed whether it's congresses, whether it's journals, whether it's online activities, whether it's guidelines. And this is how the society expresses the needs, clarifies what can be done and brings the two worlds together. So I think the societies like the ESC are indispensable to bring together the basic science world and the clinical world and to help each other grow, grow together and find the opportunities. And from your perspective, what do you think is the greatest basic discovery that we are facing at the moment that uh, uh, is inspiring us for, for future clinical translation coming in the next years? I'll immediately admit that I'm a clinician, so I do not know what the greatest basic science discoveries are, but there are a few that really intrigue me. And one, for example, are the small interfering RNAs, which I don't understand, obviously, as a clinician, 
or at least not fully understand, but if I hear the possibilities, for example, of Inclisiran, just treating somebody maybe two times a year and getting a clinical benefit out of this, I think these are ways that will change our practice, the way we deliver drugs and the way we approach problems. And so this, this is very, very exciting for me. I agree that this is really entering uh, uh, our therapeutics now. Uh, but if, if from uh, the really practicing clinician, you could say, what do you think is the weakest uh, aspect of basic science that we scientists are delivering to clinicians at the moment? Is there something basic scientists should improve? First of all, it's communication. I think what I sometimes discover is that for the basic scientists, it's completely clear what their work is good for and what the potential clinical application would be. But the clinicians don't understand it because they don't, cannot put all the steps together. So very, very clear and easy to understand communication of why, those was, why this was done and what it can achieve is really, really crucial and sometimes should be improved. And I think here is the role of, of journals such as cardiovascular research. Uh, the, uh, I think, uh, we cannot escape discussing the, the ESC, the ESC, the way it's changing and the way it's growing. I must say that during the last years, ESC has become globally, I would say, the most important cardiovascular society. What, you told me the secret of personal success. What, what is the secret of success of the ESC as an organization? Once again, I can just show my, share my personal uh, perspective on this, but I think the ESC has two unique fe features. First of all, it is very broad geographically and also across the specialties of cardiovascular medicine. It's all encompassing as far as the different aspects of cardiology are concerned, but it's also geographically broad and in the spectrum of countries as far as the income levels and the, the level of um, clinical care is considered. We integrate a huge span so we can understand lots of different problems and offer lots of different solutions. So the broadness makes ESC very relevant. And then the fact that it has always been trying to be very clinically relevant. I'm sort of repeating myself, uh, but this is where the needs are generated. This is where the benefits can be placed. So being broad on one hand and clinically relevant on the other and including basic research, epidemiology, everything. Um, the, again, the broadness of science. And this is the secret of success of the ESC. So we are facing quite difficult times with, with COVID-19. And uh, how do you think COVID is going to affect uh, ESC? Is it a disaster or is it an opportunity as well? First of all, I think uh, COVID, as massive as the impact is at this point in time, should not completely fill our minds and obscure our other strategic planning. You know, at some point, the COVID problem will be solved one way or other, and we have to think beyond that. Nevertheless, of course, COVID, with all the problem that it currently brings of you know, how to communicate and how to focus and how to continue developing cardiovascular care, COVID also has opportunities. Um, just the fact that it is showing us and removing thresholds to electronic communication, um, these are some opportunities that might be coming out of COVID. And also the fact that people maybe collaborate a little bit more. On the other hand, I'm very worried about the fact that COVID-19 and the pandemic might have lowered the thresholds for the acceptance of scientific or semi-scientific uh, discoveries, uh, which are taken up by the press and by the social media and multiplied in, in many, many times, and uh, that the threshold for scrutiny has been lowered quite a bit. And in the hype and the excitement, um, some quote unquote, discoveries are propagated in out, out of proportion way. And uh, if this tendency continues beyond COVID, this would be very, very worrisome to me. That's true. And I think that the, again, there is a role of journals to try to maintain the quality check and, uh, and fulfill its proper role, looking beyond the, the, the shining uh, interest of uh, our metric scores. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, really more. and a journal probably is not just, you know, it used to be a printed product, now it's a printed and online product, um, but maybe a journal can be much more than that. Um, and an authority uh, to verify scientific findings and to communicate them in the appropriate language, that's probably what a journal should be. 
I agree, and it's so, it is sort of fitting into our motto, basic discovery driving clinical delivery. But you mentioned several times the online and the digital aspect that is being developed, in part in relation to COVID, but ESC has always been at the forefront. Uh, and I cannot uh, uh, omit the question, ESC goes digital this year. What do you think as a previous uh, uh, chair of the program committee, how will it affect the Congress? Well, a Congress combines so many aspects of being a cardiologist, being a scientist, and being a human being. You can, you know, find out new findings in a very condensed way. You can, by accident, stumble across new observations that you have, wouldn't have made the other, otherwise. You can overhear conversations in the hallway that maybe you pick something up that is interesting. You can meet new colleagues in the queue, you know, waiting for a sandwich. And all of these aspects are very difficult to translate into the electronic world. But we will have to find ways to do that. And we will find ways to do that. And uh, so uh, this is one of the opportunities that COVID-19 is giving us, that we can move more of what actual on-site meetings give us into the online space rather than simply transmitting and absorbing information. Um, this is something that we all need to work on together and we will. All the young generation is, is working digitally and uh, online more than uh, sometimes in, 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 in real life. So uh, I think maybe it's a good uh, aspect of COVID, as you said. We all know that the online communication also harbors uh, problems such as, you know, uh, this bubble that can be created of uh, similar opinions that you tend to aggregate around you and we actively have to work against these problems so that online communication can be as good or better as real life communication. So in a way related to this, uh, is how, how ESC you think will change over the coming two years of uh, your direct presidency? Uh, are you favoring the rapid change or are you favoring a gradual uh, evolution? Well, in some aspects, obviously, there has to be rapid change. We now have to evolve very rapidly um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the effects, even though at some point we will think about it as an episode in the past, but for the next several years, we will see the aspects. Um, of the COVID-19 pandemic and ESC has to react and is reacting rapidly to, to adjust to that. But on the other hand, our strategic thinking has to be gradual. We have to take our customers, our members, we have to take them with us and we cannot you know, lose them by making rapid changes back and forth. The ESC has been very successful. We have to move these strengths into the future and this can only be done with gradual and well thought out changes and adaptations. But on the other hand, for some things, we might need quick tactic decisions. And um, this is what the ESC is doing. So is, is, it, is it possible for ESC to grow further? As uh, chair of uh, uh, program committee for the Congress, you have really made it a globally huge event. Uh, can it grow any further? Well, the question is, what is growth and what is size and what is strength? If you think about whether ESC is global, we can't become more global. We are completely global. Just to share a bit of information for you, the registration for ESC Congress Digital 2020 just opened a few days ago. And now after just a few days, we have registration from 136 countries. Can we be more global than that? No, it's not possible. So it really right. depends on how you define size. Is there room for growth? Absolutely. Cardiovascular medicine is growing. What used to be the cardiac surgeons, valve disease, for example, now is partly becoming a part of work of four cardiologists, routine work for cardiologists. Neurology and cardiology are moving together when, it's, you, know, when you think about stroke or even dementia. You recognize the connection to cardiovascular problems for dementia. So it's inevitable that cardiology, cardiovascular medicine, and with that, the ESC is growing by becoming even broader and more relevant to even more people. And even though we might have 100,000 members, there are more than 100,000 individuals practicing cardiovascular medicine in Europe. So that's also a potential for growth. So if you were to define a motto for your presidency, what would it be? Well, it's um, excellent communication. I think communication is key. Um, our interview almost started with communication, the communication between biophasic science and, um, and clinical medicine. And in order to be relevant, we always have to strive for excellence. And I think these are the two really most important mottos. 
excellence on one hand in what we do and communication in a very clear language. And then a third one that I would like to emphasize is partnership. The EAC brings together a number of various different bodies, national cardiac societies, the associations that we have. And we need to be a partner that brings together all of these and is there for all of these entities. So partnership is a third very important motto. So in the end, uh, I, I am very tempted to ask you, what is your next ambition, both on personal and on professional level? Well, I think to continuously strive for excellence, that's an ambition that should probably accompany you through your, out your entire professional life. And of course, it also tends, uh, tends to extend into your personal life, even though I have to say that I'm looking forward to my personal life after being or after having been the EEC president for now, I really have to make sure that we all jointly do our best for the ESC and help to develop the ESC even further um, towards ma maximizing excellence and being there. But this should not so much when you strive for excellence be dominated by ambition, it should more be dominated by compassion. And I think this is what I would strive for. I agree and would like to thank you for uh, this very interesting uh, uh, conversation that uh, we had for cardiovascular research uh, on live. Thank you, Stefan. You're thank welcome. you to our uh, readers and listeners. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom.